I will not beg the world leaders to care for our future. I will instead let them know that change is coming, whether they like it or not. I want to thank you all for coming. I'm your host, Stuart Scott, and we're coming to you live from the UN Climate Negotiations COP24 in Katowice, Poland. My co-host, Victoria Hirth, and you can contact us if you'd like to contact us about the contents of the program. Today's guest, seated in the front row of the audience, is Greta Thunberg. She's a 15-year-old climate leader. She's a Swedish student activist and an inspiration for all of today's youth. And today's program, Greta Thunberg's School Strike for Climate. Now, before I bring Greta up, this is my favorite photo of Greta, but it always brings me to tears. Her sign roughly translates as School Strike for Climate, and she sat for over two weeks outside of the Swedish parliament until they were so embarrassed by her presence, if I understand it right, that they gave her a fine. She was attracting so much attention from the press that they made her move across that bridge off of the island in which the Swedish parliament is located. And she's still out there now every Friday. It's no longer every day. She's gone back to school for four days a week, but received a lot of support, I believe, from her, from her teachers in carrying on, because they know how serious this is. The politicians don't know, or they know and they don't care. So we can't save the world by playing by the rules, because the rules have to change. Greta spoke to a crowd in Helsinki, Finland, that was a record-breaking crowd. <laughs> an all-time record for a gathering in Helsinki. Now, I'd like you to please warmly welcome Greta Thunberg. Now, I just want to give you, while Greta's sitting with us, an idea of what she's inspired. 15,000 people in Australia, in over 30 places, in 30 seasons. And just to add to that, uh, as you probably know, got the uh, support of, of the Senate to go on strike, despite the Prime Minister being against it. So it's really fantastic. At first, the Australian politicians chided the students and said, get back to school. You shouldn't be striking. You shouldn't be activists like this. Let me show a couple of the, the slides, and then we're going to ask Greta a few questions. So this is one of the many demonstrations in Australia. I love that sign, make Earth great again. Beware radical child activist. Civil disobedience requires no permission slips. Okay, now, Greta, what was your inspiration? How did you get into this? Yeah, uh, it was uh, when I was maybe seven, eight or nine years old, my teachers told me to turn off the lights and save paper and uh, don't throw away food. And I asked why, and they said, because there's something called climate change or global warming that the humans are causing. And I remember thinking that it was very strange that humans who are an animal species on Earth could be capable of changing the Earth's climate because if we were, and if it was really happening, we wouldn't be talking about anything else. And that will be our, f that will be our first priority. And then I started reading about it because I thought it was so strange. And, and I read about it more and more, and the more I read about it, the more I understood it. And then I started at home, I started with the turning of the lights and pulling out the uh, chargers to save energy and electricity. And so that was a small start for me. And then my, my parents, they were pretty annoyed. <laughs> I was going to say it must have driven them crazy. <laughs> yeah. But then they started realizing, and I told them that we, this was important, and, I, and we started reading about it together and watching films and reading books and articles, and before I knew it, I was a climate activist, or how do you say it? <laughs> and, and what was it that um, 
made you take your direct action? What was the turning point? What made you think, no, this is important enough and this is the thing that I'm going to do about it? Yeah, it's pretty strong to stop going to school. What made you think of yeah. that? Did you just not like school? <laughs> That's what my boy would say, I think. No, I don't. I like school. Um, but there were some youths in the USA that refused to go to school because of the school shootings. And then I was in some kind of a group with several youths that uh, we were going to come up with new projects, projects to do. And then someone said, what if children did that, refused to go to school, but for the climate? And then I thought it was a very good idea and I thought that hasn't been done before. And so then I tried to get people with me, and, but no one was really interested, so I had to do it alone. You tried to get people to do it with you to strike school? Yes. You asked your friends and they said no? And the people in that group mm. also. Mm. <laughs> Good for going it alone. <laughs> I call her online and in person, not to her face, I call her Joan of Arc. She's really rallying the troops. In this case, the troops are the kids, the kids who know that we're compromising their, their world. Just to say, it really shows the power of being a follower because you're a leader, but you, you're also following the people who were doing something similar somewhere else. And I don't know if you've seen that video about the first follower effect, but it just shows that the leadership through taking inspiration from others is, is, is really important. Um, I believe you had a very important meeting today with Secretary General Guterres. Um, can you tell us something about how that went? Yeah, it was a private meeting with uh, uh, a couple of delegates from youth, delegates from different parts of the world. And uh, then uh, I held a speech together with, with uh, a guy from Fiji. And then we took a picture. And then Guterres, he talked as well. Can you tell us what you told him? Do you remember? Yes, I talked about um, climate justice. And uh, I thought that, I told him that uh, for 25 years, countless of people have stood in front of the United Nations climate conferences, begging our world's leaders to stop the emissions. But clearly that has not worked since the emissions are continuing to go to rise over and over. And so I will not, ask, no, I will not beg the world leaders to care for our future. I will instead let them know that change is coming, whether they like it or not, and to beg the people instead to realize that our political leaders have failed us so that I will not beg the world leaders because they have ignored us and they will ignore us again. Hear, hear. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yes, our political leaders have failed us. Our political leaders are answer to a different master. They don't really anymore answer to their populations. Their only concern is making sure they have a robust economy. Everybody's making plenty of money. And then once every few years, they just have to trick the people into re-electing them, if, if it's a, really a democratic country. So although I can see that quite justifiably you're quite skeptical about these conferences and what they might achieve in terms of leadership, um, but obviously the conferences uh, bring people like you and people like all of us together. Um, what would you say would be the best outcome of the next two weeks' discussions? I mean, these conferences are, of course, they could be very good. They could be very useful, and, but they aren't. But we could make them. And so I... What I hope that we, all of us, achieve at this conference is that we realize that we are facing an existential threat and that this is a 
the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced before, and we stand in for changes that we cannot understand, that we just kind of take that in and do something with that information, because people people don't know how emergent the situation is, so first we have to realize that, and then we have to, as fast as possible, do something, stop the emissions, and just, yeah, try to save what's, what we can save. Save what we can save. I want to interject a point from news of the last couple of weeks. Donald Trump, one of the most despicable persons on earth, I believe, uh, recently dismissed the report issued by his own government saying intelligent people know better, essentially. I'm intelligent and I don't believe it, is what he said. Now, Donald Trump is probably the most pathological liar um, that I can think of. Uh, and dismisses real news as fake news while he makes up his own lies and knows that the media will cover him and make memes out of them, repeat them until we think that they're real. If a 15-year-old girl gets it, how come a supposedly intelligent president of the United States doesn't get it? So... What message would you like to give now <clears throat> to all the other children like you around the whole world? They were all listening at this moment, and hopefully, via our wonderful media, they, they will be. Um, what, what would you want to say to them? I would want to say that we have to understand, we have to realize what the old generations have done to us, what they what mess they have created that we have to clean up and live with, that we have to make our voices heard and make, make them try to clean it up after them, just to yeah, make the voices heard. And how, how would you like them to make their voices heard? What, what would you... They said, how, Greta? What should we do? You can do anything. You can school strike. You can demonstrate on the streets. You can... You can do anything. There's just one more question from me, and you might have some others, Stuart, and then I'm sure the audience may have some. What is it that gives you hope? I think that we today are very, we care very much, we say all the time, we have to have hope. If there's no hope, then we can't, can't do anything. But I think that even if there is no hope, we have to do something. That is, not having hope is not an excuse for not doing anything. Because, uh, of course we need hope, but the one thing we need more than hope is action. Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, we should look for action. And then, only then, hope will come. Uh, there's a gentleman whose name I'll mention, Dr. Herman Daly, who's said to be the founder of ecological economics, also known as steady state economics. And if we had steady state economics in place, we would not be in this mess instead of infinite growth economics on a finite planet. And Herman Daly once said to me, when I was interviewing him online, he said, it's our moral, ethical obligation to have hope and to act. So, you got it. I, I think we probably have a little bit of time for uh, questions from the audience. I was just wondering, do you think there is not so much value in um, doing things based around social media and messages at conferences to bring people's voices in or 
the only way is direct action, uh, such as school strikes, that, that can make a difference. I think that we need both. But uh, I thought why I striked is because I thought there was not enough direct action. But of course we need both. Lady third row in from the right who's had a hand up for a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. You're a great inspiration to all of us. Um, what is your message to the big business people who say there's really no problem because we can fix this problem with geoengineering, which means interfering with the planet's uh, planetary mechanisms, the ocean, the weather, the clouds, and so on. What do you children think about that? I think that it's, it's very scary because we don't know very much about it. Why do we have to do that? Why can't we just reduce and stop the emissions? Is that so hard? And I think that it can... You can say that it's like one person who is dying and says, I'm not going to have an operation, I'm going to wait. In the future there might be a magic pill that I can take. It's very risky. It's the risk of the experimentation, isn't it? Because we don't know the knock-on consequences and we have not got a good track record in that. So like you say, it's, a, it's very risky and it's also pushing it out to the future uh, when actually we have tried and tested things we can do now, which include uh, reducing our emissions. Now, we're getting very close to the end, so if there's one very short question, very short question, my name's Toby, I'm from Tasmania in Australia, um, and I actually just supported students on going on strike last week in Australia, um, and hundreds of my friends actually went on strike in Hobart. I was just wondering, what is your message to students that have been on strike last week in Australia, and you know, what's the message of solidarity that young people can send? That we, we are all in this together, and that we, we together we are strong, and we, we will not give up. We will not give up. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, Victoria and myself and Greta. This is the contact address that I promised you. If you have questions for Greta, you can send them here as well. And we're coming to you live from COP24, UN Climate Negotiations in Katowice, Poland. Thank you. Thank you.